Welcome to Simply Why, a podcast about money and purpose, where we pull back the curtain on running a financial advisory business focused on providing intentional advice to couples and families. I'm Dennis Morton. And I'm Katie Brown. Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in. We're coming up on the tail end of the school year, so we're family wealth firm. We've got families of our own. How, how's the year wrapping up for you? Oh, it's it's wrapping up really well. It's crazy to believe my son is actually just graduating eighth grade. We had his eighth grade graduation, and I can't believe I'm going to have a high schooler. So amazing. Yeah. How about you? Well, I might have been the oldest guy over at the uh, first grade pretzels and root beer party last week and then dropped my son off for a college visit the next day. So we're kind of straddling the extremes. I mean, they may have two in the middle. So it's uh, it's a little bit binary right now. Yes. A lot of young yes. stuff, a little bit of old stuff. So, but yeah. fun. And I don't want to overlook my up and coming middle schooler too. Oh, that's so, right. You've got, you got two migrations. Two migrations happening. Yeah. All yeah. fun. Yeah. Most of the time. I feel like we're kind of like coming in for the landing where we've kind of cut the engines. We're hoping the landing gear's down. We're just going to kind of cruise in <laughs> here in the next couple of days. We'll see what kind of shape the plane's in once we get off. But I, I think overall, pretty successful year. Lots of fun to be had. So interspersed with all of this, uh, we traveled recently. We had its conference season and we went down to the Wealth Management Edge Conference in Hollywood, Florida, uh, gathering of a lot of financial advisors, some service providers, technology firms, a pretty eclectic group that we met up with down there, right? Yeah, it was a great mix. I really enjoyed hearing different facets of our industry. We often talk about how there are a variety of different types of advisors in our industry, but there are tons of businesses that support all the work that all of us do. So just fascinating conversations. And there was a little bit of fanboy, fangirl opportunity down there. We got to see the Live Animal Spirits podcast, one of our favorite financial podcast, Michael Batnick and Ben Carlson were, were down there talking live, which was which was fun. They're, they're kind of the, some of the original gangsters of the podcast space. Yeah. Yeah. That was great to meet them. I always love it when I can make a, a Michigan connection to my Michigan we, roots, yeah, Ben from, Carlson being in Grand Rapids. And I grew up about half hour from there in Holland. So it's always fun. So shout out, give, give them a listen. It's a great, great financial podcast. Uh, but the reason we were down there is I had an opportunity to moderate a fireside chat on the topic of serving high net worth clients. And I thought it was an interesting topic to step back and and reflect on in advance of the conference because the high net worth space has changed. And we're typically talking about people with $1 million and above in investable assets. 20, 30 years ago, that might have been highly compensated executives, professionals. Um, There was a certain group that had a million dollars in investable assets. But the 401k has changed all of that. For many people, Fidelity does a report on 401k millionaires. You remember people that have a million dollars in Fidelity's 401k platform. Before 2014, there were less than 40,000 401k millionaires in the United States. Last year, that number was 299,000. Is that crazy? That was even down from 400,000 in 2021. That is crazy. But it also makes sense because 401ks really became prevalent in the 80s. So by the time you get to the 2010s and later, now we're hitting the first generation of people to have 401ks for their entire working careers. Yes. And so it makes sense that that number would balloon. And and obviously we've seen pensions are very rare. They're a rare commodity these days. And so... It makes sense that that number would balloon, but it's so different from a pension or an income stream because now suddenly people look up and they realize they have a lot more wealth in their accounts than they may have ever anticipated. Yeah. And it just changes the nature of advice. So we're talking about high net worth people who've been just disciplined savers over time. And I think it just changes the way that we as advisory firms need to design our services, design our our advice models change the language that we use to serve families this way. So we want to talk today a little bit about how you and I have thought about designing our firm around serving high net worth couples and families. Thinking back to when we started the practice, not every firm is designed to serve high net worth families. We had to make some very intentional decisions. What do you think was the most important decision or facet of our business that was from the get-go important to put in the DNA of our firm to serve high net worth families? I think there were a number of things, honestly, really across the board, we did think, how does this show up for the families that we serve? But I think some of the the key elements from the very beginning 
that we're very intentional about have been capacity and ensuring Mm -hmm. that we have advisor capacity. We have enough professionals on the team. We can fully support the families that we work with and that we can give them the time and attention as they need it because we can't always predict when things are going to come up for the families that we serve. And we want to make sure that we have credential advisors that are ready to support. I think also the environment that we have created, not only for our staff and and the culture, but also for the families when they walk into our office to, to help create a comfortable and I'm going to say even disarming feeling stepping into the office. What do you think? I think it's true. For those who've never been or seen our office space, we have a a living room set up. That's the space. We have a couch where families can come in, they sit down and it doesn't feel large and institutional. So I think that that's helped with engaging. I also caught what you said about credentialed. I think having every client facing advisor be a certified financial planner, that was a commitment we made early on because when somebody walks in with a million dollars or more investable assets, it's not just an investment challenge. You have to understand it from all of the complexity of where it's coming from. Is it IRA money? Is it non-qualified money? Is there a risk issue with insurance or state tax or all of those things have to play into it. So you need the breadth and depth of a CFP professional to be able to serve effectively and make sure that you've not left no stone unturned in the service model. Yes. Let's talk about blind spots a little bit. There was an experience that I had several years ago where a client came in, high net worth family, we presented their financial plan, we talked through the implementation and all the next steps. And when I asked if he had any questions, the husband said his biggest concern is, now that I'm retired, where does the money come from? Now, he wasn't talking about dividends, interest, social security. He simply wanted to know how the money got from his brokerage account to his bank every month. And I couldn't believe how I just bypassed that most simple thing that was really his primary concern. So that was a reminder that sometimes we race past to the complex solutions and forget some of the simple mechanical things. When it comes to knowledge or awareness among high net worth families, where is a common blind spot? Outside of the mechanics of how things work, and I think that it is really important to pause and make sure that we are on the same page with the clients and what we're accomplishing and how to get from point A to point B. I think something else to be aware of is when speaking with couples, one of the spouses will naturally take the lead in the conversation. The blind spot that we can sometimes have in that situation is assuming that both spouses are in the same place with how they think about the money or in the same place with understanding the strategies that we're talking about. Whereas that's often not always the case. Oftentimes, there's a little bit of a learning curve and we need to make sure that we're taking the time to either make sure everybody's comfortable with what we're talking about or taking the time to make sure that we're getting the full input from the other spouse, because they might have a very different opinion about the money and where the money is flowing or how, how things should be going but they may not feel comfortable raising their hand to talk about it because they may not be the individual that typically takes the lead. Yes. And and it's a confidence thing. This comes back to why people walk in the door in the first place. Like these are really smart people who've been very successful at, at, at saving in their careers and otherwise. And yet suddenly they're bumping up against the limitations of their knowledge and they may not even know what questions to ask. Hence our, our other episode where we talk about the questions for a financial advisor, but we, you have to make sure that they're comfortable in that there are no silly questions, that it's, it's okay to, to ask mm-hmm. something like, what is a bond? Mm-hmm. Something like that's come up pretty frequently. There's also this risk that we often see is that the whole plan is in one person's head. Yes. You realize, that, okay, okay, we've got it all together, but it's on a spreadsheet, locked away somewhere, or it's in one person's head. And uh, here's our, our pop culture reference of the day. If you remember back to the uh, early 80s Superman movies, like the Christopher Reeve version, there's a scene in the first one where he's, you know, Lois Lane is falling off of the building and Superman swoops up and, and grabs her and says, don't worry, ma'am, I've got you. And Lois Lane looks at him and looks down and says, you've got me, who's got you? And there's this, I think sometimes with a couple, one spouse, whoever's been kind of controlling the money conversation in the family, and, and it's like, controlling might be a strong word, but has, has the plan in their head. It's fair for the other spouse to say, 
who's my backstop? If something were to happen to you, but where would that leave us? And that's where the advisor comes in in the role of being that third party, that sounding board, and hopefully solving for some of the blind spots. I totally agree. I think one of the blind spots from a family perspective is exactly that. I think oftentimes that happens just naturally in the relationship and you're going to manage this stuff. I'm going to manage these other items over here. And it's not always intentional that one person kind of runs with the family finances. I think sometimes it just migrates that way. And the longer you go down that road, the more separated it becomes. And the more, honestly, the more pressure it puts on the spouse that is managing it. And the more fear could potentially build up in the spouse that doesn't fully understand what's happening in their financial picture. Sometimes it takes them sitting across the table from us to realize the risk in that or that they have reached that spot where they need to find that common ground. You know, one of my favorite exercises has been in what? ideal client profile. So we, mm-hmm. we went through this exercise a couple of years ago and you think of all the households that we serve, there are certain attributes of people with whom we work well. And we started putting together this avatar mm-hmm. and we, we still have a sheet. And I think you're, you're referencing it right now. I can see. <laughs> I'm pulling it up as, pulling we're speaking, up as we're speaking. Okay. So we have, <laughs> we have John and Sandy and we've plugged in all of these attributes, what they think, what they do, wh- where they work, their backstory, just this fully fleshed out three-dimensional picture of John and Sandy. Like what are the things, some of the things we know about John and Sandy? Oh, John and Sandy. So, well, they have three children, two grandchildren, two dogs, They have a primary residence. They also have a second home by the shore. And they are very, very connected with their family. They want to ensure that they are helping to support their family the way that they can and that money doesn't become an inhibitor in the things that they want to accomplish, but rather supports an intentional and purposeful part of what they want to do in their lives. Yeah, and the reason this exercise was so important for us for, for just things like this, what we're doing right now is when we're communicating or we're designing a particular element of the firm, who we hire, how we talk, how we communicate, does this matter to John and Sandy? Is this something that would make their experience better, that would help them to feel more confident about their future? And it's just been a great filter for ideas as we've continued to grow. What does this mean for John and Sandy? A few of the things that I really enjoyed about this exercise was pulling out some of the specific challenges and pain points that they may encounter. Because I think with all high net worth families and really truthfully, all families, there are challenges and pain points when it comes to your finances. And it's so important to have that third party on the outside. I mean, they may have all the financial knowledge, but sometimes you need to be able to step out of that and you need a third party at the table to help you make sense of what's in front of you and to help you recognize opportunities or things that you can do with your financial life to ensure that you are living your day-to-day life as fully as possible. Yeah, I I agree. Because those pain points, some of those, those concerns that they have, they dictate action. And part of what we're trying to understand in serving high net worth families is what's going to cause them to act. Also, what could potentially paralyze them? So you look at one of these pain points that we have here for John and Sandy is their fear of making a mistake. And I think about that a lot. Like sometimes we hear people come to us and there are things they haven't done out of fear of making a mistake. Like they haven't maybe rebalanced or aligned their portfolio because they're afraid of what the implications are of not doing the right thing. And sometimes that paralysis can be something that that's really a a detriment to the financial plan. And sometimes they don't come to us because they are afraid that they already made a mistake. Ooh, isn't that true? That's very true. Let's put the issue on the other foot here. What is a high net worth family, a couple, expecting from their financial advisor? What are they looking for in us that makes us effective at what we do? You know, as we talked about before with some of the the questions for a financial advisor, there are certain things that we believe are table stakes. We talked about being a certified financial planner, um, or at least having the education. There are a, a number of different credentials in our firm, but to have that wide breadth of education to be able to talk about the various finances of finance, um, be a fiduciary, and always put your client's best interests first. Beyond that, I think the next 
big quality that you really have to look for in a financial advisor when we think about working with high net worth clients is to be able to, to build a trusting connection for when those tough conversations come up. Managing the money is one thing, but helping families walk through their intention with their money and walk through their legacy desires and manage through some financial family dynamics, all of that stems from the strength of the relationship between the advisor and the family. And you just hit on something. I mean, as we're talking about people who have means, right, they have a good amount of savings, relationships matter. I think, I think, and encouraging people to do that. Sometimes we have to reroute the conversation as we're getting to know clients where they're very focused on the portfolio performance, what's up, what's down. I think the high net worth families and couples that we see that are most successful, they have healthy relationships in their family. They have healthy relationship with money, healthy relationships with friends. These are all things that kind of feed into this. And I think the advisor needs to be in a position to direct attention in the right places. And if we're constantly focusing on performance, constantly focusing on the markets, then it misses a lot of the things that make for a very successful relationship. Right. And, and to be clear too, I mean, successful relationships and healthy relationships are not always easy. Sometimes the healthiest relationships, you have those challenges and you work through those challenges a- along the way. And when it comes to finance, there will naturally be challenges because there are constant ebbs and flows some within our control, some outside of our control, a lot outside of our control, but a lot in our control too, that you have to work through some of that. But I think that that all goes to building those relationships and building that trust. Yeah. And not every advisor can do a podcast or or write their materials or anything else, but just the ability to communicate effectively and, and serve also as a filter for your clients. We wrote down for John and Sandy what they read, what they listen to, everything else. There's never been greater access to all the information and all the noise should you want it. But the advisor should be a person who acts as a good filter to say, these are the things you should be paying attention to, maybe some sources that you should be reading or listening to, Mm -hmm. and safely ignore a lot of the noise that's out there. I think it's a really important role, especially to help in decision making. Dennis, you had brought up, and I think you actually wrote a piece about this as well, really talking about how there can be any number of crises happening, but mm-hmm. not every crisis is your crisis. And, yes. and you're right to be able to confidently help the family, help the client feel as if they are confident in saying, that is not something I need to spend my mental energy worrying about mm-hmm. because it just doesn't apply to me or my family. I also, especially in that regard and in other ways too, um, modeling behavior. When it comes to news flow, I don't keep a TV in my office, nor do you. No. Nope. We're not like following every tick of the markets and we've, we're very disciplined in our information intake. And I think that creates a steadiness that high net worth families should expect from their advisor. If we're constantly sounding alarm bells or creating false sense of urgency, that's not helpful. There are enough things happening out there in life, out there in the world without us injecting crises, to your point and making more drama when it's unnecessary. And I think clients appreciate that steadiness. I think they do as well. So aside from some of the ways that we had designed our firm or some of the attributes we look for in families that we work with, what are some of the things that they are seeking from us? What do you typically see with the high net worth families that are top line important to them and that we help them work through? I think one of the most important questions that we can help them answer confidently is, can we use our money? Mm. For, for a lot of people, maybe they've, in some instances for a business owner, may have had a, a different experience of, of life and finances and then had a windfall. And suddenly, am I free to spend this money? I'm not in the habit of it. Or somebody who's been saving in their 401k for um, years and decades to suddenly turn around and to give them permission that they can safely spend on their lifestyle or in support of their family or in support of their community. And it's a mindset shift. You save, you build, you grow for 20, 30, 40 years, and then suddenly you retire and like that, a change in mindset, it's a hard thing to do. And I think what that's what they're looking for is, is it okay for me to use this money? And we've even heard some clients say, you probably don't want us to spend this. We're like, no, that's not, that's not the case at all. <laughs> we want you to spend your money. This is why you did it. 
Yes, yes. Your money is there to support your life and to bring in the fulfillment that you want. I remember one conversation I had with a client. This is on on the other side. And I just loved how she she phrased this. We first started working together and she said, all right, I know I have enough money. I know I have enough money to retire. I know I have enough money to be comfortable. I just want to know from you, how much fun can I have? Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, but I think you're exactly right. It's almost that they're looking for support and permission almost. And, and I don't, you know, I don't necessarily like to say that, but, but sometimes clients, they do ask the question, can I do this? Can I help a family member? Can I give to this charity? Can I, and, and almost that, that permissioning, but, but ultimately we want to help, you know, support them and, and build that clarity for them so that, they have the confidence in saying, hey, I actually can do this really cool thing. Yes. And if I could flip that over to talk for a second about some of our frustrations in working with high net worth clients. One of the things that jumps out at us from time to time is sometimes the client doesn't lean on us enough. Yes, that happens. Isn't that true? Yes. It's Maybe they're not used to working with a comprehensive financial planner. Everybody has a guy or a gal. Sometimes they've done some trades or invested in the past, but to fully utilize what we do to, to go deep on financial planning, sometimes it's a little bit of a struggle to draw that in and to get that process started. Yes, sometimes it is. I think where that sometimes shows up too, where it's frustrating is not only did they not lean on us, but they took an action and now they're calling us stressed because of that action. Yes, unnecessary stress, I think is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. So whether it's focusing on a crisis that is maybe not your crisis or getting frustrated and figuring out how to solve something and taking an action and then turning to us later and realizing, oh, I could have worked with you and you could have easily solved this for me, but I, I didn't utilize you as a resource. I think what we've learned about that and tried to apply in relationships is that first year of working with a client is so important, like learning to speak the same language, mm -hmm. that communication, understanding, like a lot of our ideal client profile, the things that we put in there are actual words that we've heard from clients where we say, this is how they think about things when they get to us. This is how they feel when it's working well. This is what stresses them out. And I think talking that same language creates that open line of communication where they feel like, okay, I'm thinking about this. Maybe I should call Katie or Dennis to talk it through. And we love that. Like when, once we start seeing they're, they're calling us in advance of the decision mm -hmm. and they're getting to a better place because of it. Yeah. And I think part of that goes back to intentionally having the capacity for those conversations as well. Every time a client calls in, there's a little tidbit of information, something new that you learn from them, some new way that we learn to help support them, something we get to celebrate with them. I love it when clients call up and, and maybe you or I didn't actually speak with them. And, and we hear from somebody else in the, in the office, Karen will share a great story about a trip that they went on or something new they're excited mm -hmm. about. And all of that helps us to, to better understand the families and what they value and where they're headed. We love it when clients call in. And that was actually one of the questions that came out of the session at the conference was how close is too close? Um, when you talk about developing intimate client relationships, it's one thing for us to have intimate knowledge of the client's financial plan and, be, and understand the, the inner workings of their family life. But it's also nice to reciprocate and make them feel like they're part of something in our community as well. And when we crossed over the, the anniversary of us founding the firm five years ago, there was so much great outreach from people we've worked with both for a long time and in the last couple of years, but they felt as though they were part of something. And that reciprocity, I think, is a key part to building a deeper relationship and helping high net worth clients feel like they're part of something bigger. Yes. I think it helps to build a community. That's part of the vision too, to build a community of clients and professionals leading purposeful lives through the stewardship of wealth. How far is too far? It's not that we have to spend every waking minute with our clients. We definitely don't. But I do love bumping into clients out at community events mm -hmm. or bumping into them out on a hike on the weekend or, or something else the way that we get to know them well is also allowing them to get to know us. Katie, I was thinking about how we've gotten better over the years at serving high net worth families. We're always trying to learn. We're always trying to grow. I think our growth as a firm and the ability to 
served many more people in recent years has made us better at serving families because with every new circumstance, every new conversation, we're learning something, becoming more informed and turning it around and helping answer better questions, understand where people are coming from. So our growth is really fed into our ability to serve better. What do you think? Is that true? That's absolutely true. I think our experience is definitely deepening with the families that we work with to both assist families with decisions they may be making that we have witnessed and worked with other families to kind of work through, but also as new things come up, you know, that is just as exciting for us to be able to help think through a nuanced situation as we grow as a firm and as we grow ourselves professionally. So in closing, not every firm is designed to serve high net worth clients. It takes a special skill set to understand, to uh, communicate, to design a practice to work with people who have to make big consequential decisions about money. I love that we actively put the time and attention into figuring out how to best serve our clients and to make it better and better. And this is why we grow. This is how we grow. This is exciting for us so that we can serve more families, so we can have better conversations and we can show up better prepared for the families that we do work with. So in this podcast, we talk about our why sometimes. So today's conversation was about why we've designed the firm the way we have for who we want to serve, John and Sandy in particular. And we welcome the input that we've had from clients in feeding these conversations and making us better at our jobs. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Simply Why, a podcast about money and purpose. We hope you enjoy getting to know us, how we approach leading a financial advisory practice, and the work we do every day to help families and couples make important financial decisions. Morton Brown Family Wealth is an SEC-registered investment advisor. This podcast is designed for educational and informational purposes and not intended as investment advice. More information can be found at www.mortonbrownfw.com.